great Midwest, the campus there at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois. And uh, so with that, I'll let my wife share a little bit about us. Hello everyone, I'm Jill Perez, and I want to let you guys know that we've been married now for 21 years. <laughs> which actually just happened this last week. Yeah. <laughs> Wednesday. Fourth uh, of July is always our anniversary weekend. Um, we have two kids. One of them is 16, and he's a junior, or coming up on his junior year. He just got his driver's license. Oh, my gosh. And um, we have a six-year-old little daughter who's also a princess, and she'll be going into first grade. All right. And uh, other things, you think we've been Christians now 21 years. We got baptized seven days after we got married. We were 21 years old. And we'll share a little bit about that story more as we go. Um, and so, you know, when you've been a Christian 21 years, I guess they give you a class title called Finding Inspiration in the Desert, <laughs> personal and ministerial. And so that's how that happens, I think. And, uh, and so for us, we're just glad to be able to teach a class like this because, it, you know, the, the question that seems appropriate for a class like this is, have you ever felt like you were struggling to find inspiration? Right? I, I imagine to myself, who wanders into a class called Finding Inspiration in the Desert? And you're like, you mean like well, I hope nobody sees me going into this class. I, I don't want my campus minister to see it. But somewhere along the way, and it can happen very quickly, we start to wonder, where is that inspiration that maybe I had right at first? And I've seen plenty of people start off with what I think is like Texas-sized inspiration in the Lord and then you see them maybe at the next conference or maybe the next conference after that and they just have maybe a little bit of a different look on them and they've, they've maybe been worn down a little bit and, and Satan's maybe you know used them as a punching bag for a little bit and you just see that and, and, and they find themselves and they look more like they're in the desert right you've seen somebody when they're coming out of the desert how do they look right they look thirsty beyond belief right and they're just like <laughs> water right Right? And they're just struggling even to, to, to get that word water out. And, and people find themselves in the desert and nobody like nobody heads there. You know, like even even if you're hiking, you're like, we're going to go hiking for a day in the desert. But nobody plans to stay in the desert. And, 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 and we do a class like this. And quite frankly, I think, uh, to be honest, I've seen too many people go into the desert and not make it out. And so today we're going to look at some stories from the life of Moses uh, and just his example of finding inspiration in the desert. And uh, I feel like, you know, after 21 years, we can definitely be up here and share some things that I think are going to help you when you do get to see the desert, right? And so go ahead and be opening your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. And um, the first thing I'd like to say is that there is no formula. Okay, like finding inspiration. Every like, if you're anything like me, I, part of my background is I graduated uh, with a degree in biology and a minor in chemistry. Worked as a chemist for about ten years. I want a formula for everything. Like I want, like when it comes to inspiration, I want to be like, okay, just tell me what do I got to do. Like, and then you read scriptures like Romans ten seventeen, which says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And you're like, oh, well, that's all I got to do. There, there is the magic formula for finding inspiration. So I'll just read my Bible as much as I can and I will be inspired. That's a guarantee. That is a Romans 10, 17 guarantee, right? And you're like, well, it doesn't always work that way. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about? I love it. Well, bro, you just need to go get faith. That's what I'm saying. And, and we got to get past these, um, I think, oversimplified answers for how to find inspiration when our life feels devoid of that, that inspiration. And so the first thing I can say is that there is no formula. And as we look at Moses' life, I wanted to make sure that everybody was caught up. I, I wanted to make sure that your only idea of Moses didn't come from uh, Disney's Prince of Egypt, if you will. And so uh, here's some facts about Moses' life. He was put in the, in the Nile River as a three-month-old baby because the Pharaoh had made a law to kill every baby boy born to the Israelites during that time. He was then drawn out of the river. Like if you watch the movie, you think he's Pharaoh's kid, but it's actually Pharaoh's daughter, right? And he became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And as Moses grew up there, really in the, in the house of the Pharaoh and in the family of the Pharaoh, he still knew that he was an Israelite. And when he grew up, he saw the oppression of his people. And then he killed an Egyptian who was beating an Israelite. This is around 40 years old for Moses. 
Word of this got around even to Pharaoh and his household, and Moses had to run for his life into the desert and eventually married his wife Zipporah and became part of that that Midianite family and his father-in-law Jethro's tribe. And so for us, we're going to pick it up in chapter 3, and what I want us to see is that Moses has already experienced some desert in his life. And we're going to look at his life and, and try to find some examples from him that really are going to help us. So in Exodus chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1 and look through verse 6. And my first point is this. Sometimes inspiration comes in some pretty strange forms. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. I love this whole story, by the way. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was was afraid to look at God. This is as strange as it gets. I love how in verse 4 that it says that God recognized that Moses was now paying attention. And I wonder that if verse 4 doesn't maybe indicate that maybe God had tried to get Moses' attention some other ways. And and God finally is just like, let's just set something on fire. Maybe he'll see that. Right? Because it's like God noticed that Moses got got it. He finally got Moses' attention. And there it is. He had to set a bush on fire to get, to get get his attention. And I love how he calls Moses from within the bush. And he calls Moses as a friend. Notice, what does he say there at the end of verse 4? He says, calls him from within the bush and he says, Moses, Moses. You know, when, in Jewish circles, when somebody uses your name twice, it's a term of endearment. So when somebody calls you, oh, you know, Moses, Moses, when they, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a term of endearment. It's a term like, we're close friends. No, 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 we're not friends. We're close friends. And so God is calling to Moses out of this bush in the middle of the desert. And he's calling him as a friend. You think of other times where God uses this when he calls people or when he talks to people. Even the other side of it, you think of Matthew 7 where it says, uh, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, right? That's where that, when, when, you know, when he called Samuel in his dream, Samuel, Samuel. You know, God uses that to call people. And he called Moses as a friend. But the thing is, is that, think about this situation. Moses is in the middle of the desert, and God is using something so crazy to call him back to something very important. To inspire Moses, and we're going to see, to do something great. And for us, we're going to see how we need to be open to inspiration coming in strange forms. Like, inspiration doesn't come how you think it's going to come. That's why I referenced Romans 10, 17. Like, you can't just open your Bible, use the finger method. Like, boom, there it is. That's where inspiration is going to be today. And it's like, inspiration just doesn't always work like that. And there isn't this exact way that you can guarantee inspiration. If there was, we'd be using it, wouldn't we? Because we don't want to live an uninspired life and we don't want to live a life feeling like we're getting less inspired. We want to stay inspired and stay on fire for God. And so we need to keep an open heart. I'd like Jill to share a little bit about a story. Yeah, I wanted to share um, a time where God was really calling me and it was actually when God was calling us back into the ministry. Oh yeah, Um, We had been in the ministry, we came out of the ministry, and so I was working a secular job, just a desk job, and I sat near the front, had this nice desk with all these windows, and across from us is the church office. 
and I would see the staff people going in and out at various times and I and sometimes I would catch myself just sitting at my desk looking at them going I know what they're doing today you know and just being inspired by seeing them going in and out and I would find myself just really gazing and intently watching and seeing how happy they were to go to work and wondering you know gosh you know, <laughs> here I am sitting at this desk you know and um it just definitely really was a, a vision for me that I didn't realize was a vision. Do you know what I mean? Just watching them at a desk when you're least expect it, you know, just working away, doing my normal routine, there they were. And um, it just it gave me a vision again to think maybe I could do that again. And uh, actually, here we are. Yeah. So inspiration can definitely come in some unique ways. Yeah, and even that's what Moses is doing. He's just working. He's just tending his father-in-law's sheep. That's what he's doing right there. I want to share a little bit about um, our conversion. It really is quite unique. So uh, we were students at the, the same university that we work at, Northern Illinois University. And Jill and I, we were dating. And... Uh, we uh, we had taken a vacation down to Florida after the semester ended, and we're just and we're on our way back. And you know, there's the, especially in the world, you don't know really what you're getting into in the whole dating thing. And and I remember thinking, I wonder if what she thinks about God, because I had grown up kind of going to different churches, and I didn't want to marry a girl who didn't like God, if you know what I'm saying, right? Now, mind you, we were totally sinful, not like not living according to Christ's teachings at all. And uh, so we started reading. We 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 stole the Bible. I should say. We, I stole the Bible. Yeah, I did not know where this was. She did not know that I stole the Bible until we got back from the hotel that we were staying in, and uh, and we read the book of Matthew all the way back. And and I'm like, okay. And she is just eating it up. Like I had grown to, I had grown up going to a, a church where we read the Bible and it was open. And and she had gone to a church where you know one of those churches where you just don't read the Bible on your own personally and all that. And uh, so she's like, it says that. And and you know after this like an 18 hour drive and we get back and she is more fired up than I had ever seen anybody like really pursue God in a great way. And I'm like, this is definitely the woman for me. I'm excited. And um, and so we get back and we're not sure what to do. We're just kind of hands up, don't have any clue what to do, and uh, we're living together at the time, um, and, all, and we were living together because the frat house that I was living in, we burnt it down at a party, we had a party, we threw some construction wood in the fireplace, fire started from inside, I need a place to live, I'll just go live with my girlfriend, that's where that happens, and her three, three roommates, um, so definitely in the world, no doubt about that, right, and we, we're sitting in her, in her apartment, and, I, and we just like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, how about this, let's just say a prayer. And so we're like, uh, okay, we sat on our couch and we're like, God, uh, just send us some Christians, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> that was it. That was the extent of the prayer. Literally within 24 hours of saying that prayer, the same brother from this church reached out to us both on different places on campus. It's, I'm like, it was crazy. Because, first of all, and, and he didn't just send, like, anybody. Like, here I am, you know, frat guy, thinking at the time, you know, working out a lot, whatever, feeling pretty cool and all that. And this guy comes to the to the weight room, and he wants to work out with me. Now, he was maybe 105 pounds, soaking wet. He was a white dude with a fro. I kid you not. He was wearing a pink Ocean Pacific shirt, like, jogging, that jogging pants that he turned into shorts, high tops with no socks on and he just I mean it was real he was weird looking and I'm like oh no I've got a stage five clinger what am I gonna do and I'm in the weight room and I'm like I just I, I'm like I don't listen I will have to take weights on take them off you don't really want to work with me he's like no definitely I do and he just wouldn't he was on he was unrelenting and I'm like okay fine and so we work out and after we're done working out he's like hey can I get your number to invite you to a Bible study and I'm at this point my heart is so bad I'm just turned off by the fact that he wanted to work out like I had already forgotten that we had just prayed the day before, right? And I'm so my heart that's how you know good my heart was at that point. And uh, I get back to the apartment, I'm like, You're not gonna believe this guy who lashed on to me at the weight room. And that literally is what I said when I got back later on that same night. This guy knocks on Jill's apartment door with another brother. You know, and I'm like, and she and 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 he invites, he knocks on the door. I, I wasn't home or I was in the back or whatever. I didn't come to the door, and my wife just like blows him over with her level of excitement. Like if you if you can imagine door knocking and then somebody being like, oh thank God I was, you know, like you're not going to believe this. Oh thank you God for 
sin. And, you know, like, it was just amazing. Like she scared him with her like joy and exuberance. And she was so like, I'm definitely coming. Where is this Bible discussion? Where, and it was in the, in the apartments next door. And, uh, and I didn't see the guy. And she's like, oh, this is amazing. You're not, and then, you know, like she remembered that we prayed. It was crazy. And um, so finally, it's the next day is the Bible study. We're like, we're definitely going. But then Jill gets sick, so we don't go. And this time, like he had scared her with her exuberance so much that he thought if anybody in the history of coming to a Bible discussion was coming, this woman was coming. So he actually comes back to the apartment to knock on her door and find out why she didn't make it to the Bible talk. And this time, I'm coming to the door with her. And I see it's the same guy from the weight room. And I'm like, oh, hey, Todd. And uh, and, uh, I'm like, I gave this guy my number, but I definitely didn't tell him where I lived. I'm like, I've got a stalker, right? And, and, um, and Jill is like, this is great, because Jill's like, well, if you knew this guy, why did we have to pray? And I'm like, no, this is the guy from the weight room. And she's like, oh, I get it now. And, and we explained why we didn't make it to the Bible discussion and all that. And, and it's just like, we literally, like, when the door closed, we both looked, did one of those looks at each other like, this is crazy. Like, God is doing something here that we can't even imagine. And so we sat back down on that same couch, and this was a different prayer. Kind of like the brother was talking about filled with awe, right? Yeah. <laughs> we were like, we, were, we had chills, we were scared, we were like, okay God, you're doing something here that we can't even understand. But help us just to do what you want us to do. Amen. And there wasn't no like, it was just amen. Okay, God, go ahead, do what you got to do. And we got involved in the, I'm just saying, God comes in strange forms. It could be a burning bush or a white dude with a fro. He does, I mean, there, no way I'd have been friends with this guy in the world. No way, not in a million years. God, you know, God does amazing things to help us get inspired. But what happens if you're not ready for it when it comes? The strange people that will sometimes challenge you in life and use words to try to inspire you, but you're not open to it. Because you just it has, to, it has to come in the way that you have decided it needs to come. It has to come at the conference. Right? It has to come. This one, I put all my eggs in this basket of this class. Inspiration in the desert. This is where I'm going to find it. Maybe. And it might be some other class that you really, you know, that's happened. I, you know, I've been to conferences and, and just stood before and be like, oh, I'm like, there was a class called Dare to Dream Again. And there was a class called Dare to Go. And I felt like I needed to dream again. But instead, I went to the Dare to Go class and it's still inspired. You know what I mean? Like, you, like inspiration will find you when it's, when it's coming. <laughs> and so for us, we just have to be absolutely open to inspiration coming in strange forms. Amen? And Moses was open and he was ready for it. Let's keep reading. You know, because what we find here next is that inspiration doesn't always come in our time, but it's in God's time. Amen? Amen. Let's keep reading in uh, chapter 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Let's just stop right there. Here's the question I immediately think. How long is God willing to allow us to wander in the desert? And I think the truthful answer to that is as long as it takes. And we don't, we're not okay with that most of the time. And, you know, the Israelites were enslaved for 430 years. Moses was in the desert for 40 years. I think here's a good question to ask, ask ourselves with this story. At what point did, Mo, did God love the Israelites the most? Think about that. At what point did he love the Israelites the most? Was it when he, when he brought them out of slavery? No. His love was a constant. It never changed. Even when they're in the desert, God still loved them. Like, we're afraid of the deserts. God's not afraid of the deserts. You know, the truth is, you know, like one third of the world is some form of a desert. There's a lot of deserts in the world and there's a lot of deserts in life. 
They wandered in the desert 40 more years after they came out of Egypt, right? We all know that story. Right until they got into the promised land. Even Moses, he was in the desert 40 years on his own before God called him. Then the bush comes and you're like, okay, let's go do this, right? And then for 40 more years, he wandered in the desert with the Israelites. Some of us can't even imagine living 40 years. Really, that's how impatient we can be. And so for us, one of the keys to finding inspiration in the desert is just not like freaking out when you're in the desert. You know what I'm saying? Like the desert is its not a good place to be. None of us wants to be there. But there's no reason to freak out. Freaking out will get you killed. Spiritually, that's what will happen. Freaking out will get you killed. I, I, I like this quote from uh, Josh Harris in that book, um, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It says, Like a fruit picked green or a flower plucked before its blossom, our attempts to rush God's timing can spoil the beauty of His plan for our lives. And, and sometimes we find ourselves in the desert and we just start to completely freak out. And, and we get overly anxious about it and, and we don't know what to do. And we start to doubt our salvation. We start to, we start to count the cost on all kinds of things and our mind just gets very, very weird with it. I'll go ahead and let Jill share a little bit about this one too. Absolutely. Yeah, please. Yeah, I can definitely share in this area um, just how with God's time it's different from our timing. And one of the things I had struggled with for a while was just this idea of bearing my own type of personal fruit. And what I mean by that is I, I had this idea that I had to personally meet somebody, study with them, and see them get baptized. And I put this huge burden on myself with it. And it was almost like carrying this huge backpack around with me. And there were times where I just felt so insecure about it. And it literally took years for it to happen. And so my insecurities would come out. I would cry about it a lot. And here's the thing. I was actually in lots of Bible studies, you know, like... And I shared with lots of people, grocery stores, co-workers, neighbors, you name it. I was constantly out there sharing my faith and wondering, when is this going to happen? And a lot of it stemmed from Matthew chapter 7, uh, verse 6 and verse 20, where it says, by their fruit you will recognize them. And um, just that thought, like, I just had to have this, you know. And... Um, the crazy part is, is many other people would meet people. I'd be in their Bible studies. I'd help them become Christians along with them. Um, there was fruit coming, but for some reason I just had it in my mind. It had to be all me. And I had to learn that it was not all about me. Yeah. And um, that God had a plan the whole time. So the great thing is, is it did happen eventually. It took years. <laughs> Um, and now I think of Galatians 6 verse, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Yeah, and I think that is that is the thing about being in, in the desert is we, we have to change our mindset about being in the desert so that we don't give up. Like that's the practical from that point is you if you change your mindset about what it means to be in the desert, don't give, you, you just don't give up as easily. You know, life is going to offer us plenty of opportunities to be in the desert and find failure. And how we view that failure is going to have a lot to do with whether or not we get out of that. And one of my favorite um, inspirational, you know, kind of speakers and leaders is this guy, Augie Garrido. He coaches baseball down at Texas, University of Texas. And here's some of the things he shares. He says, life is going to make sure that you fail and fail a lot. So now that the coach becomes in support of those failures, we want you finding out more about yourselves. That's the value of failures in life. Life is a game of failure. You do your best, you're going to fail, so you do your best again. And the minute you think you got it all figured out, life is going to have you for lunch, no doubt about it. And so we just keep moving forward because we got to be the kind of people who are failure tolerant. You know, and I know for us, I think, you know, even our perspective in campus ministry, we can, we can see, you know, struggle, struggling in a campus ministry can be very difficult, can it? Right? Because you feel like the whole world's watching you. Especially some of them, the smaller the campus ministry, the harder it is sometimes. You're just like, oh, everybody knows I'm struggling. Why don't we just post it on Facebook and, and get it over with? <laughs> Right? And it's just, and we just have to be more failure tolerant. We have to recognize, like, I, I love it, you know, we're a bit older now, you know, and hopefully a little bit wiser, right? And 
I just don't freak out when people struggle as much. It's like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do that. God's going to teach you something through this. It's going to happen. And terrible things happen in people's lives and we don't always handle it correctly. Right? And, and, and sin and temptation and we fall. Even and, and it's not always the people you think that are going to, right? It's like, you can't tell who's going to fall and who isn't. There is, you know, you can't always see that. You can make, you know, you can say, oh, you know, that brother's doing great. Great. Okay, good. But where's he going to be in 20 years? Right? Well, you, you can't see that with your eyes. You can see some things with your heart. I'm just saying, we can't freak out when people struggle. Whether And we can't freak out when we struggle. Uh, well, the desert is a place, I mean, really in the Bible, when you look over and over, the desert is a place where people go for safety. Like, David ran from Saul in the desert. Right? Jesus, uh, Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, what did they do to get away from Herod? They ran to the desert. Like, there is some value in the desert. The, the, the desert isn't always the, the negative place that we think it has to be. We've had some desert times in our life. I'll tell you what, you know, 21 years, we are not that couple that is just like this person. We've been in the ministry, out of the ministry. We don't know, you know, we've done just about every kind of ministry in the church. We've struggled, we've needed help, we've been on both sides of it. It's just, you just can't, you got to learn not to freak out with it all. And then the minute you think you've learned not to freak out with it all, God throws you something that you freak out over. No, that is totally how it happens. Because I really do. I think of myself as more secure now. And then I was just telling, this is just last week, I got with our disciples and I'm like, I feel like I'm, I'm, like I'm over, like I'm in the shower and I'm going to bed and I'm thinking about these situations that are like making me anxious. And I'm like, why? And I'm not upset at the people that are making me anxious. I'm upset at myself for being so anxious. Like, why am I freaking out about this? It's just more desert. And you've been through plenty. So don't feel like this one's going to be, you know, the desert doesn't have to be the end of it all. And it doesn't have to mean that, oh, my ministry's going horrible. You know, we've had times, you know, even this year, this is great. We had, we had like first two months of the year, we didn't, you know, we went two months without a baptism. And if you're in campus ministry, you're like hitting the button already, right? And, um... And then, you know, we're like, and for our campus ministry, which we had about, you know, 16 people in our campus ministry, and we finished the semester with like seven, right, in our, in our little DeKalb church there. And I thought, okay, but there was a moment there where I started to freak out a little bit. And I had to remind myself, oh yeah, by the way, God doesn't judge me on this, and I, I need, this is just another desert. So I think for us, we have to realize that we have to be more failure tolerant and we have to keep persevering because the desert isn't the end of it. Amen? And, and we see that in Moses as we look at these stories here. Let's keep going. Let's, uh, let's, point number three, you know, inspiration has a purpose. Let's, let's, let's uh, look on in verse 10 and look through verse 12 here in chapter 3. Here's what it says. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Inspiration... It always has a purpose. There's never just inspiration for inspiration's sake. It's not like we're in this room to get inspired so we can go sit back at home in our bedroom and just, um, you know, like, I am more enlightened, I am, ex- I, am, I am inspired. Can't you tell? I'm inspired. No, just look at me. I'm inspired. I'm glowing. And it's just not like that. <clears throat> inspiration always has a purpose. And Moses' purpose was to go get the Israelites out of Egypt. Like, that's no small task. Like Moses, God's like, Moses, by the way, I'm going to send you back to where you're probably wanted for murder and you're going to bring back almost a million people and bring them out in the desert. And no wonder Moses says, who am I? Wait a second. And you keep reading and eventually Moses, some of it's kind of, oh, like his initial response is okay, right? You, when, when God calls you to do something, you shouldn't be like, yeah, certainly, why would, you, why would you pick me and not, you know, of course you pick me, God. Like, that's, you don't see that in the Bible. That's not how people respond. But eventually God does get angry with Moses because he's like, I can't do it. But it, it's just this idea that inspiration has a purpose. And it's not just for inspiration's sake. God had a job for Moses to do. You know, no person recorded in the Bible has ever become a Christian without the help of some other disciple. Think about that. Like, God has always had a purpose 
for other people. Like we have primary callings, right? Like just making a disciple is a primary calling. Like that's not a special gift. It's not in the gift list and any, any gift list that you see in the Bible. But for us, just even making a disciple, we, we got to live an inspired life just to do that, right? Because we got to be inspired to do it. God always has a purpose for us. I think of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. It says, You have received comfort so that you can comfort others with the comfort you have received from God. To me, when I read that, it changes the way I look at my life even. Because everything that we have received in our life and all the bad that even we've experienced, God can take that comfort that you've received and He can use you to, use, to, to help somebody else. And isn't that exactly what's happening with your life as a Christian? Like God doesn't just mean for you to keep it to yourself. And it's not just the gospel you're sharing. You're sharing so many more blessings that God has given in your life. Like someday you're going to be sitting down with somebody and sharing about raising kids or marriage or dating or something. And you're going to be able to share some pretty awesome things with them. And it's not by accident. It's because God helped you first. Like we have been blessed. And because we've been blessed, when we get inspired, we go help other people to do blessed things. You know, Nehemiah had his wall to build. Moses had his people to free. Abraham had his distant land to get to. Samson led his Philist had his Philistines to kill. Peter had a king kingdom to usher in. Paul had the Gentiles. Timothy had like a list of 20 towns to go missionary, be a missionary to. I mean, it is just a long list of, of, of things that God has called people to do. For us, we just have to know that God has plans for us to do something. Like when we get inspired, we really do want to do something, don't we? And when we, when we start feeling uninspired, we just, oh, it's me. And we just get into those activities that are no good for us, don't we? Like we think more about like how much, you know, I know they had the social media, but all the time we spend just doing Facebook stuff or whatever. You know, clash of clans or whatever your favorite thing is and all that stuff. And I'm not against any of that stuff. I think they can be a lot of fun. And, you know, of course, 23 hours a day, maybe not good. You know, I think we all get that, right? But, man, when you're feeling uninspired, you can really run into those things. And, and you start to rack up the number of TV programs that you're now following. Like, well, I was just this before. Like, we like The Walking Dead, right? That's one other thing about us. We really like The Walking Dead. I don't know why. Actually, it's her that got us into it. But, you know, no, for sure. I w I'd, I'd watch it like this at first because I couldn't handle, you know, anyways. But, but I'm just saying, you start to rack it up. I mean, and there's enough TV and movies and stuff out there that you don't ever have to, like, like wake up. I mean, you can just clash a clans your life away or whatever. Right? And, and yet, that's not what God's plan is for us. His plan is to use you to help somebody or some group. His plan is for you to get inspired in such a way that you start to have a vision for what things could really be like where you're at. You start to have a vision for your family. You start to get inspired. And you start doing things that are a little bit strange. A little bit out of the box. And you start really getting the courage to go say some things. And you know, God's going to use you. When you start getting inspired, inspired words start coming out of your mouth. And you start to you start to approach people a little bit differently and with more faith and with more vision. Oh, you're totally going to become a Christian. You say that to somebody you just met. And they're like, what's going on with this guy? Right? And we just we start to get inspired. Because when we see that there's some purpose that God has for us. You know, 2 Timothy 3.16, a scripture we're familiar with. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful. Useful for what? Verse 17. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped and prepared for every work that God has for him. That's the purpose of all the inspiration that we may receive. Like any inspiration you receive from this conference, God wants to use it not just for yourself, it's also for somebody else. <laughs> I think for this part, it just draws up a question in my mind. If God were to inspire you today, what do you guys think he would inspire you to do? If he gave you some kind of conviction, some kind of passion that you're feeling inside, what would you do with it? Think about that. What would that be for you guys? Because whatever that is, that's the purpose of our inspiration, right? And... Um, I was just thinking about when I do struggle and I do feel those deserts, 
sometimes my prayer is take this away you know like take this away even for others and it draws me more to that thought of how can I struggle and do well through it yeah instead of just trying to push things away yeah I would elaborate too I, I think people struggle and our prayers for them are very they, we need to be courageous enough to have prayers even when people are, are like it's always tough especially when somebody is is, is dying right? right and we want to pray, pray faithful prayers God heal and I'm all for faithful prayers but sometimes when it, there's a situation where you just know it's you know they're, they're, without a major miracle this thing is going and, and so my, my prayers later in life have been, God, please help this person to die well. And help the people around them to accept it in a righteous way. Like that's a different prayer. And it's okay to pray like that. So I, I think even our prayers for people who are struggling for inspiration need to, be, need to be that way sometimes. Point number four, let's go over to Exodus chapter 15. So they moved on. I love it. They, so they move on from desert to desert. So it's great. They uh, we'll, we'll see this here in chapter 15. So we're skipping all the part where the, the plagues in Egypt and all that good stuff. And uh, we're going to pick it up in 15 verse 22. You know, often finding inspiration is a test from the Lord. Isn't it? Verse 22, it says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. He said, If you Listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes. You pay, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs and seventy palm trees, and they camped there near the water. I love this. They're three days removed from going through the Red Sea. They had just been baptized. And three days after that, they're already struggling and grumbling and find themselves in the desert. And I love that I'm looking out into this audience, and mostly a young group here, right? And you, they, like we think, oh, we're too young to find deserts, right? No, three days after your baptism, you could find a desert. Like often, like even Jesus, right, in Matthew chapter 4, he gets baptized, what happens next? Temptation in the desert by the devil. I mean, temptation comes quick. And when at, right after your baptism, I, I tell you what, it's almost like a guarantee it feels like. Like old boyfriends and girlfriends all of a sudden who haven't dialed your number in years, like are calling. I'm like, yeah, that's about right. I had a brother. We had this one single brother and... Um, it was crazy. Like he had this this girl. Like he had just gotten, uh, you know, restored to the church actually. And he um and all of a sudden he starts getting these calls from an old girlfriend up in Minneapolis, and we're in Illinois. And I'm like, oh, this is okay. Nothing, you know. Yeah, just ignore her calls. We'll be okay. No, she shows up at his door with nothing but a coat on. Now he survived that trial. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Right? But I'm just saying, that's the kind of stuff that happens after a baptism or after a restoration. Right. That's just how it goes. Immediately, temptation is going to come in that form or you're going to find yourself in a desert. Uh, it's just like, I mean, that's just what happens. It's crazy. It doesn't even make sense. And so when we think about it, it's all just a test. And, you know, if I said I was going to issue a test right now, half the room would get out of here. Be like, it's the 4th of July. He better not. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's like, we don't like tests, do we? We don't, we don't like any tests at all. And there's always a desert or a test that's going to come in our life. It's the nature of God to test our faith. Abraham was tested via Isaac, Noah with the flood, David with King Saul and Bathsheba, Solomon with many women, Samson with women, Judas Iscariot with money. You know, the opposite sex and money comes up a lot. Those are huge temptations. Like when you're in the desert, the biggest temptations that will often come your way is somebody of the opposite sex or something to do with money. That's, those are just easy places for a bitter root to start. And what were the waters of Marah? They were bitter. 
And, and Moses, you know, what does he do? He throws a piece of wood. Again, strange ways that inspire, you know what I mean? He throws a piece of wood. God says, here's a piece of wood, throw it into the water. Now the waters are sweet. Of course, that makes sense. Why not? <laughs> That's exactly what we should have done. Like, who's going to figure out that plan? Right? And we're all tested. Every single one of us is tested. You know, we make decisions to make Jesus Lord, sure enough, and then the desert comes quickly. There's the same principle in the New Testament Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1. It says, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even, through, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, we may not like it when we're tested, but how do we feel after we've passed a hard test? How do you feel? We feel a lot more confident and inspired, don't we, right? That's it, exactly. And the test, that whatever test that you may be going through now or later on in life, you get through it, you persevere, you're going to feel a heck of a lot more confident. I feel that way. Like in life, a little bit about me, like I, I, I grew up, my wife didn't grow up this way, but I grew up kind of poor. You know, I moved 23 times before I graduated high school. That's a lot. And we weren't a military family. And it was mainly over poverty and stuff like that. And we had all these situations. I can remember, you know, um, you know, no hot water for a couple of weeks. I can remember we lived off of like cornmeal mush for, for a while. I don't remember how long, you know, the Salvation Army cornmeal mush. But one thing about growing up that way, like I'm not scared to be poor. You know what I'm saying? Like when you've seen poverty, you're like, yeah, bring it on. Whatever. Been there, done that. When you've been through tough situations, you feel more confident when you have to face stuff. Like even in the ministry, you know, we've been campus ministers and in leadership for a while. We've seen some crazy stuff. Stuff you'd be like, no, not in the kingdom of God. Yes, in the kingdom of God. I had to break up like a knife fight one time. I, I kid you not, this brother, you know, he, uh, he, was, he, didn't, he needed medication. He wasn't taking it. Next thing you know, he pulled a knife on his roommate. <laughs> like, okay, that happened. Right? <laughs> had to deal with brothers caught in homosexuality, interns sleeping with a husband in the church. I mean, we just see crazy stuff. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, and it's all just a big test. What are you going to do? Are you going to give up on God when the test comes? And just have a pity party? Woe is me! Oh, it's all just so awful. And, and you just get negative. You can get negative real easy. And the negative stuff can absolutely just overwhelm you. It's so easy to get negative with a test. And all you can think about is the test. And that's all you can... And you can't think about finishing the test. And it's just negative, negative, negative. And it does you no good. And then life is just stinking miserable. And then that's what you're left with if that's all you learn to focus on. And that's why it's, it requires such a mindset change. we got to remember that when the testing comes, it results in confidence and it results in inspiration. So that when you face something later in life, you're like, okay, yeah, this is no big deal. You're more prepared for it, and you're just ready to take it on because you're not afraid of future tests. Yeah, when I think of tests, I think of um, some Bible studies that we've been through. Okay, yeah. And <laughs> there's always something with them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what I wanted to say is that sometimes, like, I'll look at a Bible study and I'll think, oh, God, this person, they're going to make it. They're going to be our sister. I can't wait. i got plans. I'm already thinking about what they're going to be doing in the ministry, you know. And then it doesn't happen, right? And so um, I definitely think of this one girl, um, you know, they definitely can break your heart sometimes, right? She was very religious, but yet very humble. We would study the Bible with her. It, it was like angels were present because her response was that good. And it was like, oh my gosh, this girl is going to make it. She is going to become our sister. I can't wait. I'm so excited to see what she's going to do. Guess what? She didn't make it. How am I going to respond during that test? A lot of us sisters, we can definitely take it very personally. It can almost crush us. It could crush us for weeks after that. But we didn't let it crush us. Um, and I still pray for her. And still, hopefully, we'll run into each other again next semester. And you never know. Um, then we had this other sister, and uh, or, or the girl we were studying the Bible with, who wasn't a sister yet. He actually met her boyfriend on campus and been studying with them week after week after week after week. Finally realized 
he has a girlfriend. So I try to get in there and study with her, and she's just so hard to study the Bible with. I'm like, oh my gosh, where's this other girl that's so easy to talk to, you know? And uh, so we just keep trying, keep trying. Even even just to set up a Bible study was, you know, rather difficult with this person. And, uh, and one particular night in the middle of the studies, they went out to a bar, and if that gives you an idea too, and she puts a quarter, you know, on the uh, pool table to hold her place in line. Some guy comes by, wipes it off, she punches him. <laughs> she ducks this guy. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do with this girl? I hope she doesn't duck me for some of the things I'm going to have to talk to her about. <laughs> But you know what? It even came down to counting the cost with this girl. And I said to this other sister, I really need you to be in this cost counting. I'm really not sure she's going to make it even tonight. But amen, we're going to count the cost with her, and um, this is what we're going to do. And next thing I know, we were baptizing her within like an hour. I was so blown away. And you know what? Those are the tests I love. Because I felt like I failed the test in my faith, but God didn't. And it is all about God Amen. and not about me again, right? It's about what God's going to do and waiting patiently to see how God's going to work in someone's life. I, I can't come up with all the best things in the world to say to these people to convert their hearts. But opening the Bible, wow, yeah. God's going to be the one to do it. Amen. Yeah, and that sister, she's an amazing sister even today. Like, she gives you the warmest hug. And, you know, to think about her punching that dude out, it was crazy. I'm like, she is tough. She was from Texas, too. That's probably why. That's how they roll in Texas, I think. All right. And uh, so lastly, inspiration can be found in, uh, in, in old places. Like, uh, let's go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 19. All right, Exodus chapter 19. I love it because you know what happens to Moses is, uh, first of all, they, get, they, they leave this desert. Oh, I forgot one other point in that last one. If you notice in the last scripture on the last one, after you're done with the test, where did they find themselves? At an oasis with like 70 palm trees and a bunch of water. The nice thing about when you're done with the test, God usually provides an oasis for you for a while. It isn't just test after test after test after test, unless your name is Job, in which case, <laughs> bad luck for you. But um, So usually there's an oasis. After a test. All right, lastly, Exodus chapter 19. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> 1 through 6 here. It says, um, and the last point is sometimes it's in old places. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai, after they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob. And what you are to tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And you know what I love about this is where he's at. If you remember back in chapter 3, God promised Moses when he sent him to Egypt that when you're done, you're going to come back and you're going to worship me right here on this mountain. And that's exactly where he is before he's about to go and get the Ten Commandments and all that stuff. The, the, the law and everything. He's back at Mount Horeb. And it's like, you know, sometimes inspiration can be found in some old places. I love it. I, I love the fact, you know, we're in DeKalb, Illinois. That's, and that's where we were converted back in 93 was DeKalb. Like even Wednesday, I'm driving my, uh, or not driving, I'm riding my bike back from a, I was, uh, an appointment that I had. And as I'm riding, I'm like, oh, and I'm riding through the old apartment where that, that Captain Fro knocked on our door. Right? I'm like, there it is. And it makes me thankful. And I'm, I, actually, it did inspire me as I'm going, I'm, here I am just pedaling, right? Da, 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 whatever. And, and, and I'm like, man, that is awesome. Here I am, 21 years, almost to the day. And, and, and there's the apartment where God did something miraculous so that I could become a Christian. Like, inspiration can be found in places like right where you just became a Christian. Like, you don't have to travel the world, right, to find inspiration. Sometimes we think the only place inspiration is, is like Indonesia. That's where it's got to be, because it certainly isn't here in Illinois or Wisconsin or wherever you're from, right? It's got to be way over there, because it feels like it's way over there. 
and so we feel like we got to go ever go go everywhere we are. But it, but it's but it's just neat. I mean, I love it. You know, it's kind of neat. Uh, here I am. We 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 are we're campus ministers right where we uh, right where we got converted. Everywhere I look, there's something. Like when I walk on the campus, I have appointments with people, and I remember having those same appointments with my campus minister, Mike Wozneski. Right? I, we go into this one room, the Trident room, and I had to have a real like a humdinger one day in that room, and Mike had to tell me what was what because my heart was just super prideful. And I, now I sit down with people in that room. I'm like doing the same thing. It's just cool. I love it. I love it. You know, um, I drive past the house where I get baptized in the backyard. Just it's it's inspiring. And so for all of that, it, it's just we have to realize that we can find inspiration even right where we are. Right? So did you want to share some things about that? What's that? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, it is almost time. She's recognizing the time. So I think for us, here's the thing. We just absolutely want to want to make sure that wherever inspiration can be, we're going we're gonna to be ready for it. Let me just summarize and conclude with this. One, there is no formula for inspiration. As much as we may want a formula, it's not going to happen. We have to be open to inspiration in any form that it may come. We can't freak out in the desert. That's what gets you killed. we got to recognize that God wants to use us for a good purpose. we got to resolve to pass any test. And we don't have to go looking halfway around the world to get it. Amen? We can find it right in ourselves. Amen. God bless. Enjoy the rest.